Welcome to our fifth episode of Becoming a Post-Growth Planner, Obstacles and Challenges to Changing Roles and Practices. My name is Christian Lamke. I am Assistant Professor for Sustainable Transformation and Regional Planning at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. Hey there, I'm Viola schulz dikov I'm from TU Dortmund University. I'm a research assistant here and working on post-growth planning mainly. And yeah, I would like to say hello to our guest today, <laughs> Tina Kulam. So maybe you'd like to introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here. My name is Tina Köhler. I am professor for land management at the Frankfurt University of Applied Science since two years. And my research interest is the development of rural areas with a high out migration with demographic change and thus a high rate of uh, vacancies in housing. Thank you. Yeah, you've quite some experience also in planning practice, in connection to practitioners, in, especially in Germany, in different parts of Germany. So our first question to you, if you look into your experience, how would you describe a typical planner today? Who is this, the planner? Uh, in fact, I am a planner because I studied once planning at the TU Kaiserslautern. Um, however, I'm definitely no typical planner because I like a bit creativity and I'm no artist and this is something typical for a planner, isn't it? Um, besides the skills to design something, to create a plan, a planner is a person who tries to solve all the land use conflicts arising from the different demands. Someone who tries to solve all the or to find out the best way to meet all demands on land use. Of course, most of planners are determined or even restrained by politics because in Germany the land use planning is a municipal competence and policy affect land use here straight without digress. Um, however, planning is a participatory process. Everyone could make suggestions how to improve a plan and in the weighing of pros and cons for or against a new neighborhood, for example, a planner has to explain why he or she has taken the advices or not. This is one of the most important tasks of a planner to weigh the different issues to get back to the question. Um, a planner should be a person who could see beyond the own bubble, <laughs> um, who can think out of the box and gets the big picture. Land use always is a mirror of the society and their needs and thus it is so extremely complex to plan the land use. So it's a very complex uh, topic, yeah. of course. Um, what do you think? What um, what hinders, or why is it important to understand what hinders planners to think and act uh, in a post-growth direction? Planners have a legal framework they are bounded by. The, mo the, both, the both most important laws of planner states in the very first paragraphs that planning should foster a sustainable de development of land use, followed by a list of some sustainability goals. Mm -hmm. And this is what planners and land manager have in common, the goal of a sustainable land use development. However, the instruments we have are all growth dependent. And this is why, this is what hinders planners to think in the post growth direction. For example, when developing a new neighborhood, the value of the land increases. Yet the zoning plan already causes a first increase and as soon as the roads have been built, the value per square meter land is at least 100 times the value of agricultural land. The local authority is allowed to retrain a huge share of this increase. Uh, this is the principle um, called value capture or value capturing and it is a principle one can find all over the world. We even have a European cost action that aims to spread this extremely growth dependent principle. Our institutions want to gain money from the land, thus they are 
growth dependent too. And this is what hinders planners to think in this post growth direction. All the framework is growth dependent and you can't make money with a green belt. Yeah, def uh, definitely hard to do. So mm -hmm. if you look into your own work, what inspiration does your work offer to practitioners who want to cha uh, change their mind, who want to think differently? Or also maybe what made you think in a different direction if you engage with all these instruments that are growth dependent, as you term them? Um, why we should do this is, I think we, get in, we need to get away from this either or understanding. Currently policy institutions and in resource planners have to decide either for climate adaptation or species conversation or economic growth, for example. One can see this in the common agricultural policy where all measures for nature's earth and at least for people are only possible by direct payments. And um, this gains no sustainable land use. And we want to achieve a regional justice and to reduce the land consumption and both we can in my opinion only and exclusively achieve by a more sufficient land management and a new dispersion of functions and what i offer is hopefully to get away from this growth dependent instruments land management is so diverse has so many aspects so many facets and all aspects are intertwined and i'm not able to address all independencies of land management as a whole but i would like to raise awareness that land management does not equal urban development only the land management needs to be as well unsealing land reduction of land use extensive land use or to say in other words that sustainable land management does not equal to make money from land and this is what i want to achieve unfortunately all our instruments are growth dependent i said that before and plus my re research is about how to make the instruments of land management such as development plans and land readjustment and urban redevelopment growth independent how to get the money out of the instruments how to measure development beyond money how to achieve a equality of living conditions apart from uh, the, the the money just uh, the economic growth i have two questions to you because that's very interesting so do you have any examples already where um yeah, cities go into a different direction uh, yeah, during their land use management. But also, if you speak about your idea of um, yeah, doing it differently, what kind of feedback do you get from diverse actors of land use management? Mm, most land management say, no, this is no possibility. <laughs> The, the privacy benefit of land management instruments is one of the most um, important parts of the instruments. And the, the private benefit is only measured in money. Um, but in my, in my home country, <laughs> in my hometown, it's it's not town. <laughs> it's not a town. Um, they try to establish uh, land management and uh, planning beyond growth. They want to measure um, the the, um, the the life or the conditions of life in a new index. And. They try to, to break this wish, vicious circle of um, reurbanization and um, the loss of people in the rural area. They just try to, to, um, to get back people in their area and they try to say goodbye to Christella's central place theory. They <laughs> this is not easy because this is the framework of our planning in Germany, when um, we just try to get um, a 
away from this central place of ERT. Because in my opinion, we should have a real community and um, yeah, short, uh, short supply chains um, and just to get back to uh, really to, to rural areas. Why do you, why do you think is um, Cristalo's concept a bit um, oriented backwards or not really helping us out right now? Because it, um, it concentrates all functions in the urban areas and make rural areas dependent from the jobs offered in the urban areas. And um, this raises also uh, commuters um, or people just uh, move to the cities. Um, and on the other hand, it raises the, the, the share of um, or the, the value of um, land in the, in the in urban areas. They, um, the rents are very high, pollutants and noise in the cities are extremely raising. So I guess we should, we should um, divide the functions again, more spread in the area. So what would you say is really, are rural areas maybe really good to try practicing different alternatives, practicing new instruments and going towards post growth? Yeah, I think so. Because the communities are small, people know each other, um, they could have a better local economy. Um, the participation is easier because um, there are less people. And <laughs> um, this is why I think um, rural areas could be an example to, to test. Um, post-growth planning. Yeah, uh, interesting perspective. So let's ath assume we want to test. So there is a planner or more planners uh, who want to test. So what would you advise such a planner today to take then the courage to say, okay, I will really use post-growth thinking. I will make a start in that direction. I believe that planners alone cannot overcome the growth dependency of planning instruments. Hot, hot. <laughs> planning is a very participatory process that should actually be conducted from within society. There are countless participation formats and these should be used to establish the idea of postal growth in, in planning. I think there are so many civil society movements that want to improve the world <laughs> and planners should use these forces to establish post-growth planning from below, so um, just bottom up from within society or to put it in terms of multi-level perspective by involving civil society movements more, post-growth planning could move from this niche, from this small part to the landscape to spread. It will be possible, for example, to invite specific groups that operate solidarity-based agriculture or climate activists um, to participate in planning process, to broaden the view of the other participants. Sorry. <laughs> Many people have never heard of postal growth and it is in many ways a uh, very academic concept, but if planners manage to integrate this concept more into everyday procedures by mobilizing civil society forces, this could change in my opinion. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the planners are creative people and I'm sure some of them will come up with way to incorporate the concerns of post-growth planning into the balance in the yeah, way of it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what does it mean more in particular for the skills that planners need so do you see new or different skills that planners may need more or more in depth in the future for going into that post-growth direction mm. 
maybe to weigh the sustainability goals in another way. Um, the sustainability goals are always competing with each other. We know this. And unfortunately, economic efficiency has a bit more pri priority always. And planners even learn this when um, at the university they learn that uh, the most important thing mostly is the money. <laughs> and maybe they should learn to weigh the sustainability goals and um, to maybe the idea of growth independent planning must be introduced into the planning process while the weighing up of interests. The individual planner can certainly become active here. A few years ago, we were told that climate protection and adaption to climate climate change must always be treated as an important consideration in the planning process. And this is a good thing. Perhaps it will be eventually lead to sufficiency when we have the growth independent planning, the post growth planning um, here in the in the weighing, in the plan weighing. Yeah, thank you. That's uh, nearly closing up to thinking about what is post-growth planning then. So if you take that idea a, a step further and try to make a short definition or a statement from your point of view, what is post-growth post planning? So if you finish the sentence, post-growth planning is Post-growth planning is, in my opinion, the only way to get closer to a sustainable land use and a sustainable land development. And it is an important part of a post-growth society. Thank you. An urgent call to link sustainability or a strong sustainability to post-growth. You've also explained that post-growth is partly already there. Maybe it's our sustainability goals and that we need the skills to readdress them, especially uh, the non-balanced part apart from economic growth. So thanks for this perspective and the rural parts. So not only about cities, but uh, <laughs> all that's in between the central places. Yeah, thank you very much, Tina. And it's very good to know that there's uh, people teaching like you. And I think that's a very <laughs> good um, good thing to yeah, give some young students, because I think they're very eager to learn post-growth planning and different perspectives. So yeah, thank you very I much. Just, I just had a, a bachelor thesis about this. And um, indeed, it was uh, someone from the urban agglomeration of Frankfurt and um, she was just astonished that um, rural areas could be worth living. <laughs> yeah, I share the same experience with uh, some students in Groningen or so many rural areas around that are really, really nice. <laughs> so thanks again for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.